It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. All right, everyone, welcome back. Another great episode of Beneath the Helmet. Uh, season two kicking off to be a great start uh, 2024. Uh, some amazing guests so far, and today's another one. Today, I got a chance to sit down and have a great conversation with a retired and former Oakland, California firefighter, uh, author, and fellow podcaster. Today, I'm joined with Jason Sotel, who is the author of The Rescuer, and also his latest book that just came out, Jesus is All We Need. So we talk a lot in this conversation about trauma that he experienced and some of the the issues, but everything, everything we talk about has a lens about faith and how that supported him. And it's, it's kind of a message to everyone to find their own way to manage the day-to-day stresses. I'll take a, I'll take a little nugget from Kenny Mitchell in a previous podcast, um, thinking of everything between the yellow tape and outside the yellow line, right? This conversation is definitely faith-based, but really it's all about finding what works best for you uh, in your journey become a first responder, firefighter, and just your own mental health journey. So I hope you uh, enjoy this great episode. Uh, Jason's a great guy, and he really has a, a heart uh, for the fire service and allowing people to be the best they are. So enjoy this episode. Until next time, stay well. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Another incredible guest today. Today, I get a chance to stand with Jason Sotel. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about who Jason is and kind of uh, what brought you to where you're, where you are today. Um, maybe how you got into the fire service, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit about uh, now what you're doing in this life. Yeah. I, I started in the fire service back in 1993 with what was then CDF fire here in California, which is now Cal fire. But um, you know, I was truthfully, I was skateboarding around, hanging out, kind of being a young teenage punk. And I met a group of firefighters and kind of talked with them. You know, they're just being cool while we're skateboarding, made conversation, you know, casually. One just said, hey, have you ever thought about being a firefighter? And I said, well, what do you got to do to become one? And they said, you have to have a high school diploma. And I'm like, well, I'm out because I had a high school dropout at the time. (laughs) But I went back and I got my GED. And that conversation just stuck with me about how cool they were. So I joined a thing called the CDF Cal Fire and stuff. But before that, I was in the California Conservation Corps for a couple of months. And we were at a big fire feeding the guys at fire camp and doing that kind of stuff. And I met some more firefighters. Just the whole community just seemed really cool. And I was at a point in my life where I'd never really had team or family around me. And I just loved the family concept. And every guy or gal I talked to, they just really seemed proud of what they were doing. But more importantly, they seemed committed to what they were doing. So I went back and I applied for a seasonal firefighter spot and lo and behold, I got hired. And to fast forward the story, then I went to EMT and paramedic school and I, my, my heart just had a desire to work in a bigger city. So I applied for the Oakland fire department in Oakland, California. And I told all the right lies. I mean, I had a great interview. I'm just dealing with it. I had a great interview and you know, the process went through. And I ranked high on their list. And so I got hired by the Oakland Fire Department. So my total career lasted 22 years. It got cut short by an injury. Um, Worst day of my life, but it's also looking back on it. It's propelled me into a position where I get to be now, but I missed the heck out of it. But that's the story of my fire career. And there's a lot of fill-ins in between, obviously. Beautiful. What was uh, working in Oakland like? That must have been, uh, you know, I don't know what years were those that you were at in Oakland. Yeah, you know, I started in the mid '90s. First off, on the ambulance, and then uh, um, to the engine and the truck companies. Once I got on the department, and uh, you know, it was—I'm going to be honest with you—it was true culture shock because I grew up in a small town in Southern California, and I never really experienced a big city. And what makes Oakland a little different than other California cities is everyone's packed into a small little area. You got the Oakland Hills, then you got the San Francisco Bay, and then you have a swath of land there. And it's just really condensed with really good people, but because there isn't much industry left anymore, and it was always a blue collar town full of industry, automakers, the Clorox plant, all that kind of stuff. 
once they left, it also left a void of income. And as we know, when there's no jobs, you know, a lot of crime can fall in. Not to say that there's, I mean, the, the good outweighs the bad, but we all know that bad just infiltrates. So, you know, responding to like shootings and stuff like that, I, I'd never really experienced that as a CDF firefighter. I went to plenty of, you know, grass fires, car fires, even house fires, but nothing compared to what I went to in Oakland, where we had old Victorians right up against each other. I mean, you couldn't even get to the backyard unless you took the block a lot of times mm -hmm. and stuff. So these old vintage houses and old warehouses and, and then the crime and all that, it was, it definitely kept you rocking and rolling. That's for sure. Mm. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was pretty heavy in gang uh, culture as well in that area, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, believe it or not, it was more heavy in the drug culture, mm -hmm. you know, where we're like a lot of times in Southern California, it's the Crips and the Bloods and all that. In Oakland, it truly was like the drug trade. And there's even some <laughs> crazy television shows uh, or uh, documentaries, or documentaries that have been done, like the Cocaine Cowboys and stuff that shows how the drugs came straight out of Columbia and Oakland and dispersed out. So when you have that drug element, also the level of violence just goes through the roof because street corners are now worth a lot of money. Right. Whereas opposed to, you know, gang territory, yes, they have their drug issues and stuff. But when it's true drug trade, yeah, we would go to, I mean, just countless murders, it felt like. And as you know, a lot of people that get shot, as sad as this sounds, don't die. So the amount of shootings that we went to are crazy. So when you hear there were you know, 280 shootings in our part or 280 murders in our part of town. Imagine how many shootings we went to where people didn't die. So wow. we were always going out the door on some sort of violence. And, and to be honest with you, that was the part of the job that I never really, you know, you enjoyed doing, but it wasn't like you did it so much. You just wish it would stop you sometimes, you know? Yeah, that would have been, that would have been something for sure. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about uh, your injury that you, that you had that kind of, kicked you out of the fire service. How, how did that happen? And, and what was that? Yeah, it's pulling weeds at the firehouse. And that was it. They took me out. And that's, that's what I tell everyone. <laughs> Darn weeds. Um, you know, the true story was like most firemen, you know, my in, in a busy area, even non busy area, just lifting people at two in the morning, kicking in doors, you know, and we, we could catch two to three true working fires per shift, mm -hmm. you know, it started to, to get to me a little, but what happened was we were at a warehouse fire in an old, uh, uh, metal fabricating shop and there were holes in the ground where they used to have the vats below ground instead of above ground back you know in the turn of the century and they sealed those off well people come as you know and like to scrap metal out of the old warehouses and stuff so we're in there fighting fire and as we finally realized hey it's time to back out the truck guys were up saying hey the building we're it was in it there was nothing worth saving or risking our lives for at that point so as we started backing out i fell into one of those holes and i didn't see it and i went down and I thought I broke my, my leg, to be honest with you, but come to find out it crushed my back and, you know, injured my hip. And when I came out, I went through the surgeries and I went back to work and then I was throwing a ladder and it went out again. And then finally, you know, pulling some weeds took me out. So there's the big story, but the, the true injury comes from a fall when I was at that fire. And that's when I had my first surgery. Then I had two right. surgeries after that. And finally the city said, you couldn't be a firefighter. And you know, truthfully, I was one of those guys who fought to stay on the job, but I also had to come to a reckoning, you know, being, you know, later in my forties and realizing that I've had a great span of career since I was 18 years old, that I was actually doing more harm than good, but stepping away was pretty rough, bro. That's for yeah. sure. What uh, kind of supported you through that transition? Cause that's, that's a, it's a hard kind of thing to swallow, right? That yeah. automatically boom one day you're working one day you're you're not right so how did you manage to get through that process well you know for me it was a definite struggle because it goes all the way back to my childhood that you know i grew up with nothing you know in in a very poor house my mom left us when i was just seven years old and i was left with my dad who's a vietnam veteran who had to deal with all the uh, demons of his past so my childhood basically sucked to keep it real and when i became a firefighter it was like the first time i found the true me but hear me out after the injury, as hard as it was, I walked away and I was upset with the doctor and everything. Cause like, what am I going to be now? Who am I? I've been Jason, the firefighters, how I'm going to feed my family. It's how I'm going to do. And now I'm a nothing. I have, I mean, dude, there's not many jobs out there for firefighters who have gone their whole career without a whole lot of schooling outside the fire service. And so I was devastated, but in my faith is what carried me through because Everyone that, uh, you know, gets to know me, they realize I write faith-based books now. And so 
but it was actually a good time for me to lean on my faith because I was, quote, idolizing the fire department, meaning the fire department made me who I was. No, let's keep it real. The fire department is an incredible, awesome job. And we're so blessed to do it. I mean, it's a blessing to fight fire, serve people and everything, but it doesn't make you who you are. It's just part of the overall thing of what you do and stuff. But unfortunately, I was idolizing it. I'll be honest, man. I didn't know how I was going to carry on. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I went through an area of pretty good depression there. And I even shut the guys out from the firehouse. And I write about that in my book that I apologize for some of the guys that I just walked away from. But I had shame and guilt and everything else that was in there. And I just couldn't, you know, look the guys in the eyes. And so what truly carried me through was the guys at my local church, faith, um, starting to write, write about my careers and finding ways to help people through my career now that I was done. And that helped me start to rehabilitate, if you will. Hmm. So that's kind of the, you mentioned earlier about the worst day of your life, but also the best day of your life. And that was that, that moment. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely was that moment because, you know, in, in my Christian faith, we're always told not to idolize, but looking back on it with my quote, scriptural goggles on not to, to get too churchy here and stuff. When you look <laughs> at it, I was truly idolizing the job. And stuff. And so it was a huge lesson there for me and stuff. So yeah, it was the worst day, but it was also, I tell people it's the best day. I mean, we can look back at major instances of your life. Like, let's be honest, maybe joining the fire department was the worst day and the best day of your life. You know, it's the best <laughs> day. But you you can always find, I believe in the tragedies, something good that you can bless and help other people with, whether even it's a shooting. Let's look into that. What did I learn? What's something I could pass on to another paramedic? What's something I could pass on to a CISM team? Stuff like that. So that's what I look at when I say the best and the worst day. Yeah, it was the worst day, but it was the best day because now I get to look back into a 22-year career, pull those messages out and still help the guys that are on duty and also help guys who have just retired. I mean, leaving the fire service after 30 years in a retirement, man, that's, a, that's a, a big void that's there. So I get to help guys like that and it's been pretty cool. Well, you're not the only one who's idolized the fire service. That's for sure. It's a pretty common thing that I see on the podcast as well as people I talk to, right? It's like, they live their whole life as a firefighter, uh, right. even before being a husband or a wife or a, mm. a son or a father. It's like fire comes first. And it was a lesson that I had to learn that there's more to life than fire. As much yeah. as we love it, as much as we love it, there's more to life than fire. Well, I believe you have to have that dedication to the job because as you know, it is a lifestyle. You're living it. You're doing it. But the hard part is, as you know, is spending 24, 40, heck, 96 hours or even longer in a firehouse or on a strike team or, you know, an assignment. So is that detachment is truly hard. And I always tell people it's that time from when you close the door on the firehouse, fire up your truck or car and you drive home. And then I'll say, walk in the door. It's like, daddy's home. But just 30 minutes before or even less for guys that live close to the virus, they were just in a fire. They were just telling, you know, a 90 year old woman, the love of her life has died from cardiac arrest. They have all this stuff. And so they find that it's easier to stay firefighter, stay fireman, stay firewoman, you know, and stuff, as opposed to saying, no, I am now dad. I am now husband. And people say, how do you do that? I'm like, okay, we're going to have a long talk. We're going to have to do about 18 <laughs> podcasts to get you worked out there. But it, it definitely can be very dangerous too, because we cannot idolize it and we have to find ways to get away from it and be the other person we've been called to be too. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a transition? kind of ritual for when you came home after shift and kind of came yeah. home to your family? What, yeah, what was you know, like? for, yeah, for, for me, it was um, what really helped out was I lived an hour away from work. Mm. And no joke, just turning on music. I was like, oh, he's listening to Christian music. No, man, I'm listening to Metallic. I'm like, yes, I'm listening <laughs> to Christian music too. So, but just that decompression time, I'm glad I didn't go right from the firehouse to home. And this is a personal thing. Mm -hmm. And then for me also praying, and, and reading my Bible. And there would be times where I would truly have to pull over before I would go home because I was in the right mind. And I'd be thinking about ways, boy, I better, I hope the house is clean. And I'm already thinking about ways to fight with my beautiful wife when there's nothing to even fight about. And when I recognized that I was in that position, it meant I was holding on to something from the firehouse and I needed to shut it down. So I would pull over and I'd read my Bible and that's what worked for me. Obviously, not everyone is walking in the faith I am or have things, but I tell guys and gals, you need to find a good way of decompressing. It's not drinking. It's not doing bad things. It may be like going for a good run or something too, but I think we got to really reconnect with what the real world looks like. Stop being in the protector role and move into being a normal human role. And that's a lot to ask of, of folks. You know, it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point.
Yeah. Once again, I, I struggled with that as well, but uh, my amazing wife uh, was the one who kind of initiated some sort of transition for myself. Right. And right. Spoke, spoke to my kids when they were young and said, you know, dad just needs five minutes. Right. He's going to go take his uniform off, which is a critical thing. Take the uniform off. And that's uh, almost a sends a signal to your body that it's time to now turn into daddy mode. Right. So, right. Yeah. Right. No, that's, that's such a good thing. And I, I, I fully agree with that, you know, and that, that's, I mean, as a chief, I couldn't even imagine I'm not even going to go to that level of trying to detach as a chief, you know, it's and tough. Stuff because I have many other, my friends and, you know, the beauty of mm. Oakland fires, we're big, but we're not so big that we don't know everyone. You know, I was friends with the chiefs that were there and stuff. And I would look at them like, yo, I'd rather deal with the problems over here on 34th MLK than you guys are dealing with downtown and stuff because I can't, you know, the medicals and the fires don't follow me home more than the mental aspect, but at the chiefs level and administrative level, Man, I don't, I always told them, you guys need to punch him. <laughs> you need stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So tell us a little bit about your mental health journey. What, what were some nuggets that you could share with our audience about your journey through, um, you know, obviously you talked about your childhood up to mm -hmm. adulthood. What were some of the things that worked for you? And what, what were some of the things that uh, were challenges for you? Well, you know, what didn't work for me was I thought joining the fire department each step when I, we came, started working at CDF. Okay. Things are going to be better. Now my past is going to be behind me. No, I showed up at that job with a whole lot of baggage and then started getting more baggage. Then I go to Oakland fire. Oh, now I'm going to be making better pay, less hours. I'm working this incredible schedule. I'm going to go to so many fires. Life is going to be great. But all my problems of my past still followed me there. And what I was hoping would make me better actually wasn't and I didn't leave myself open to find ways to even heal myself from the the rocks I was picking up and throwing in my bag from being a firefighter and so for me truthfully I for the first 10 years of my career I was in a downward spiral I was well liked had lots of friends I was a go get them firefighter I mean not sort of pat myself on the back but you know I have a few awards and you've got to have the grabs and things like that but what people didn't realize was I didn't want another ding award. I didn't want another accolade or a good job. I just wanted to be okay. And I wasn't okay. And it became a self-recognition of when I finally saw myself and a lot of the patients we were responding to, like suicidal patients, a jumper on the Bay Bridge. I saw myself in his eyes. I saw something was there when I'd look in it and I started realizing, and, and you know, not to give a tagline to a book or a movie or anything, but I was called to rescue people, but I didn't know how to freaking rescue myself, you know? And, and that was a struggle I had and being a tough guy and a macho guy, no one knew this about me because I shut everyone out of that world and stuff. I was just that funny, ha ha, the demon seed is what they called me. Go figure you know, the Christian <laughs> firefighters, the demon seed. Demon seed yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is a, um, I was him, but it wasn't until I finally hit, you know, whatever your bottom is. I, I it's hard to say there's a rock bottom and where it is on everyone and stuff. Oh, but I finally hit a spot where I just couldn't carry on anymore. And all of a sudden someone recognized it. And it truly came about a few minutes before I was ready to take my own life. A San Francisco firefighter came by and he didn't even know what he was doing, but he invited me out for a meal. But as firefighters always do, he was assessing me and he saw in my eyes, something was up and he would not leave. I just wanted to go surfing. Well, that's where I was going to go in my life. And he said, no, we're not going surfing. We're going to get some pancakes. That's just how it's going down, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was like, just to have that, it clicked something in my head that I still sat, I was still depressed, but there was something more for me. And then I met a girl and then, you know, the guys were talking to me about church and different things and stuff. And for me, I'm going to be honest with you, the whole CISM route and the whole stress management, it doesn't work for me unless it has a faith-based component. It never did work for me. Now, I want to be so clear to people. I'm not preaching that that's the route you need to go. I want you to get the help you need if you're struggling with that. But once I started learning about faith, and, and honestly, when I got trapped in a high-rise fire and I thought I was going to die and everything, that's when, you know, heaven and hell, the whole the preachy thing became real to me. And, you know, my, I, I turned to faith. And once I became a Christian, people say, so Jason, did it get all better? I'm like, no, it still sucked. Trust me, I was still going to all this bad stuff, seeing all these horrible things. But I now had true clarity that, hey, this isn't my problem. I had true clarity of what was going on, where it was coming from. But ultimately, I had hope. And I think when you give people hope to hang on to, that is what will carry them through and stuff. Because I don't know if there's ever true healing because things will come back a lot of times. But when you have the tools that give you true hope and you can lean back into that hope, 
it, it gets you through to the end, you know, and that's what worked for me. And again, this is a personal thing. So I want other people to say, by all means, seek out the help that you need. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like from what your, your story there is the, the faith was kind of something new into your adult life. It wasn't not something you grew up with. It's not something you were kind of born and raised in that environment. It was something new that you found as a, as a way to find hope. Um, is that I, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I grew up in a faithless home and my dad actually could not stand Christians. And I wasn't an atheist per se. And when I say none, I wasn't like a chick wearing all that black stuff. I think type of nun, you know, and <laughs> had a, no, I was a nun. I did just had no faith. I didn't believe in anything. And I was angry. I was just an angry individual. And so when I saw someone happy in their faith, it made me angry. And I, I would almost make them feel bad. Like there's a part in my book in chapter two, where I actually curse a pastor out of my firehouse. Because he showed up after a double fatality fire to ask us how we were. And boy, I let him know how I was. And I told him to get him and his fake Jesus and all this stuff out of there. And it wasn't, I was mad at him. I was just mad at myself and mad at the world. And every time something looked good that I didn't feel like I could have, I would just tear it down. So yes, I was a faithless man all the way up until the age of 28. And then uh, that's when, when my conversion happened. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get your point of view on the difference between spirituality and religion, what would you say is your, how would you yeah. separate those two? You know, what I look at is religion is like a work. You got to work and do things and you got to do this, that, and the other and work your way stuff. And then spirituality that can re it can go into so many things of a worldly type or, you know, for me from the Christian spirit, meaning the spirit world would be Jesus, God, and the Holy spirit. Right. And so, and so when definitely Christianity is quote a religion, but for me, it's more of a faith because I lean into it. Cause, cause what is faith? You know, like I could look at a chair and believe I could sit in a chair, but until I sit in that chair and it doesn't collapse, I don't have faith in it. You know, even though you're not thinking like that. So faith for me is something that has truly helped me in my life and is the truth. So for me as a Christian, the whole Bible is the truth. But as a Christian, I respect the fact that someone who is not they don't see it as the truth. They're not, not that they're blind and, and deaf for real, but they're blind and deaf to my truth and stuff. And my truth says, this is where your spirituality is. This is where everything is here, but it's not of the world. It's of God. And one day I'm going to be home with him. I'm just traveling through as the common thing is, is I'm just an ambassador of heaven working my way through, through this broken fallen world. But it's a beautiful thing because I now let my spirituality, if you will, or my faith draw me through. And then religion on the other side, I cannot stand religion because you have to do so much work where in Christianity, Christ did all the work, <laughs> you know, we just follow him and put our faith in him. So that's kind of yeah, my yeah. long story theological uh, lecture for you out of that, <laughs> that sounds without good. boring people either or driving them away. <laughs> yeah, yes. So I'd like to dig into the faith a little bit more. What's, what's faith from the fire ground? What's that mean? I, I noticed you, you mentioned that before and just kind of want to get your point of view and your story of what faith from the fire ground means. Yeah, you know, the, the faith on the fire ground is, first off, there's different levels of faith. Like, I have faith in the guys around me, but not the same faith that they're going to get me to heaven. You know what I mean? And I lean into them. And, and people go, so Jason, on a way to a fire, are you going to pray? I'm like, pretty much no. I'm now ready to go. It's kind of it's kind of like when you're going to a fire, do you stop off at the fire academy to learn everything that you need to learn and then go to the fire? No, you're equipped. You have the best equipment. You've been given everything you need. And then you show up with it and you use all those tools to help other people and stuff. So so on the fire ground, you're 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 using your faith. You're using everything there. I mean, using a halligan, using all that kind of stuff. You're well equipped, highly trained people, the best equipment that you can have. But you're using it because think about this. You, you're given a badge. I mean, you pin many of you guys and gals, you know, giving them badges and, you know, raise your hand. You're now a firefighter. But what if that firefighter never chose to leave the firehouse? Are they a firefighter? You know, it's the same thing that happens on the fire ground. And then when you show up to the fire ground, you try to be the best version of you that you can be. You know, you take all of that and you you learn and you learn from your mistakes. And, and that's why I tell people. The faith that I gained on the fire ground, it doesn't come from your can of corn structure fire was room and content. They're a lot of fun. I love putting those out. Sorry, people's stuff burned down. But you don't, let's be honest, you don't learn much. That We're learning and you grow in your craft or your faith comes from the failures. Like, bro, what was up with that door, dude? I couldn't get through it. And then fires out. Let's go talk about it. Let's learn from it. You know, or 
why didn't we get water quick enough? Let's all, let's not yell at it right now, but let's go back and figure out the problem so we can be a better well-oiled machine when we get back. So, so I try to bring that teaching to everyone that, you know, you can, you can grow in your craft. You also grow in your faith, not from the good stuff, but truly, I think from the bad stuff you experience. Yeah. I love that. Fail forward. Always fail yeah. forward, right? I'm always learn like from that. Your mistakes. Yes. Yeah. So tell us some of your key kind of highlights that you, because I know you do a lot of speaking across uh, the world and love to hear some of your key kind of messages that no matter what presentation you're doing, you just, oh, the, that message is always there. What would be some of those top ones? Well, what I bring is no matter what, if I'm listening to a speaker, I want to see it, you know, transparency can be used in so many ways, but transparency, like, let me know a little about you first. I want to know who you are and what you are and how you got there so I can understand how you're talking me through these processes that you're wanting me to learn. I know it's kind of confusing sound, but what I do is when I show up to speak, I let people know, hey, first off, I'm a Christian and my faith leans heavily over here. But check this out. I learned from Muslims. I learned from atheists. I learned from anyone. I learned from any community. I learned from them and stuff. But that's who they are. This is who I am. So I make it very clear that, that that's where I'm coming from. So a lot of times I'll say, so you're going to hear some messages coming out of me and, and you're going to say, wait, that's out of the Bible, but just erase that for a second. I'm going to tell you guys, this is from some really wise dudes from about 2000 years ago, you know, and, and then I'll cite scripture because I, I believe there's so much wisdom there that even non-Christians can hear like, you know, laying down your life for others, you know, laying down your life so others may live. Well, that's John 15, 13 pulled there. I'm not going to spout that out, but then I'll tell even a school teacher, when you walk away from your family and you show up to school, think about it. You're laying your life down. You're laying who you were down to serve those children. Now bring the best version of you. So, so what I do is I tie it together, but I will always bring it based on my faith. Mm. The other message that I love to talk about is PTSD or trauma. If I say PTSD, I'm going to have this group over here. That's not blah, blah, blah. Then if I say trauma, everyone has this name for what it is. So I break it down and go, I'm here to talk about trauma because trauma causes pain and pain sucks. You guys, pain just sucks. So call it what you want. You know, if Jason, it's, it's an injury, not a disorder. I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, put that aside. If I kick you in your shin, it's going to hurt. Let's yep. talk about that. Yep. And what I love to bring to people is I want you to find some help. I don't want you living here. And, and if you're a Christian, please hear me out. If you're not a Christian, my prayer for you is to find the help that you need to, to get you the life that you deserve to live. And then I always tell them this, I always plant that seed. And while you're getting your head cleared out, I'm praying that you're going to hear the voice of God, you know, and they'll chuckle, <laughs> they'll laugh and everything, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff. And I think it's real important to be personable, but don't be fake. But also don't be overbearing because I have brothers in the Christian faith. They'll be like, Jason, you had a chance to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to this. I'm like, bro, if I pe preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, they would have thrown stuff and I would have shut them down and I would have lost them. Mm -hmm. I was preaching it by truly showing them how much I love them, that I want to get them help. So those are messages that I like to bring around the world and to anyone I speak to. But I think the way it's different is a lot of people are scared to bring the faith-based approach to it just because... We got to be equitable to all sides and everything. And I'm like, I am, but we need also go get a Muslim speaker too. Go get some other people too. As if yep. I'm coming in with who I am and I'll never back away from that. And I think it resonates with people. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely causes divisions in communities, right? Religion and stuff, that kind of thing. Yeah. And for myself, I, you know, I know loads of people that are very uh, kind of heavy into the church and, and, and they go and that's, and that's their life, but they don't. Like you say, they don't preach it. They don't, they don't push it on people. And I think that really resonates with a lot of people because it's like, mm -hmm. this is who they are. They are living their true life and, and they're not going to push it on me. And I think that's a critical part that doesn't leave a sour taste in your mouth, right? Where you're just getting told how to show up in the world, right? And I think right. well, well, leading yeah, by example yeah. is mm -hmm. how it should be. Right? You, you nailed it. So I've been told, my commandment is to love on people. Okay, what does that look like then? What does that look like? I need to start realizing what it looks like. Now, obviously in my faith, there's a whole prayer off to the side. I'm not going to trip you out and say, okay, Arjuna, I'm going to be praying for you now and stuff, you know. But when I go off to the side, I am constantly praying for people. 
And, and my, my true prayer is I hope I gave them something that wants more of what I have. I don't want them to want more of me. I want them to have more of what was given to me. And, and I hope that that sparked and it's classic firefighting. Like I preach this, if we tried to find happiness in the outcomes, this would be the suckiest job on the face of the earth. Okay. Yeah. Because I want outcomes to always be a decent outcome of the way I want. But what I tell people is find joy in the response that you responded. You showed up and did what you were called to do, knowing that the outcome is going to be what it is. And for me, God handles outcomes and stuff. And so when, when I talk with people, I've been called to talk. I've been called to go to that fire. If I get to that fire and someone dies, well, I gave up my all. That's, that's not my fault. You know what I mean? And stuff. And, and same thing when I'm speaking to people that, Hey, if they catch something more and they want to have more conversation with me, go for it. If they don't, it's okay. I still got joy. And I got to hang out and talk with some people for a while and, you know, bring them some good for a little bit. I can really see that mindset and that faith that would probably reduce the stress and trauma that we experience as firefighters that where some, some firefighters, they own that stress when they leave, mm -hmm. that person yeah. didn't make it. And I I'm responsible. What could I have done better? What could I have done this? And that faith kind of concept would be kind of releasing that stress. Is that, yeah. am I right? Yeah. So, so, so from that side of it, again, not to get too preach on you, here's what helped me is God gave me these gifts and abilities to be a paramedic, to be a firefighter. And then my job was to now recognize that and show up and use them to the best of my abilities, do everything I can. Cause there's some scripture that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. What a fake way of telling people that scripture, because if that was, if I brought that the way that people want to be brought, everyone would live, right? Because I, well, I did the way the Christ one, they died. No, what that's saying is Jason, it, it did everything he could possibly do. He recognized all the gifts and abilities he was given. He brought those to the patient, he brought those to the scene, but there was a different thing that was going to happen no matter what I did, but I still had to respond. So that's where I'm coming from is telling guys, fi find joy, find happiness, find comfort in responding. Now, don't get me wrong. When you're dealing with dead people, it sucks. I tell people that all the time. It hurts me. It crushes my soul. And, and every few minutes, I'll, God, why? You know, why? I'll ask that question. But the answer is, you did good. You did good. And let's be honest. If there's something you could have done better, find some happiness and you learn something to do better. You learned a, a, a way to bring it to the next person. I love how many times you've used joy because that was my word of the year last year. Oh yeah, a word that I never really, honestly, used much mm -hmm. in my life, and uh, yeah, it's it's brought me a lot of joy saying that. <laughs> this yeah, year's word, for some reason, is beautiful. It just yeah, it, it, everything it, I say is beautiful. I don't know why. It does. It just you know why, why do like you meet so many folks sometimes? You're just like, why are you so hateful? What's going on? Does there's no joy in hate or no joy in sadness or no joy. I, I mean, we, and we all experience. Don't get me wrong. I get angry. I want to punch people in their throats. You know, I'm not this perfect guy and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, when I look back in those times, I didn't find any happiness or joy there. So what I try to do is slide over to how can I find, find some joy in this situation? You know, what, what, no matter what it is. Yeah. Like it, like it. So you talk, obviously you uh, have kind of two themes and kind of in your presentations about trauma and PTSD and then the faith base. So trauma and PTSD, what's, what's in your self-care toolkit to support you? I'm assuming faith is in there so we can, we can check that box. Mm -hmm. What else would be a self-care tool that you could share with the audience that just really resonates with you and something that's really worked well for you? You know what I learned is it's also good to get away from, everyone says you should only talk to firefighters because only they're going to understand. Mm -hmm. Well, I find sometimes when I would be talking to firefighters, we just keep reliving it, reliving it, reliving it as opposed to being around non-firefighters and sometimes having to, ex when you explain it to them because they've never lived it. And it's gotta be a strong person, obviously they can handle and stuff was I had a group of guys that I could just talk to and tell them, then they would pose me questions that firefighters would never pose to me, you know, and would get me thinking and stuff. So for me, I love the brotherhood. I love hanging out with the guys and doing the trips and doing all that stuff. But I'm telling you what, to, to have that group of people that have nothing to do with the fire service, and, and to just have that decompression period and, and have them ask you those questions without, they, they would ask more about the human me as opposed to the firefighter felt like we're just a crew away from work, <laughs> you know, as if, so that would be really, really good exercise. Okay. I, I can't say that enough, even as an author now, or when I'm upset, getting outside in nature and hanging out and doing something, 
Go on a 10 minute walk makes you feel better. Read, but read stuff that is good if that's your thing or listen, you know, and everything. Um, and, and I truly feel it's good to have a person you can 100% confide in. And for me, that's my wife. That's my other half is, is I can confide in her and back and forth and she can help me work through it. And there has been times I've had to go get psychological help because there's been a lot of baggage there. So, so those are the tangibles that I say to have in your toolbox is the basic go for the walk, talk to people and everything. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of times you're going to need a lot more and, and get that professional help and then listen to what they can offer you also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hit a lot of key points there. And yeah, my wife is my rock as well. And I couldn't have gone through this whole journey in the fire service without her, that's for sure, because she was yeah. there from day one. Yeah, yeah, and you know, nature, just before this, I was outside with the, the dog in the sun. And yeah, it's it's such a, it just up uplifts you right away, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just being out in nature and with the trees. Right. Yeah. Like people say, my dogs, I love my dog. And it's not truly my PTSD dog, but it's a gift that's given to me that I can pet and have fun with. And it's like, loves me. It's just showing a just total love and everything. So, so for me, if someone has a trauma dog, good for them, but it's just another thing in the kit that I love to come home to my dogs and hang out with them. And when times are tough, sit there quiet with a dog that loves you, man, that's an incredible feeling too. Sure you know, is. I mean, there's so much out there, you know, but, yeah. but what I do tell people is when someone comes to me and says, Jason, I need a beer. Well, they're going to like, oh, does this Christian drink beer and stuff? Well, you can figure that out on your own. But what I tell people is, you know what? We'll catch a beer in a bit, but yeah. I want to first find out why you feel you need one. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever someone says they need something, I want to find out why they need it. I want you to realize you need some help. Not that it's psychological. Maybe just a chat like, yo, what's going on? Well, I had a fight. Okay, let's talk about the fight. All right. Well, I want a beer. No, let's talk about the fight first. We'll get over there. Then we're going to chill and relax in a build up time while we enjoy a beer. But don't turn to substances whatsoever, in my opinion. And I'll preach that to anyone because it's going to lead you down the wrong road. And it's not going to be a good one whatsoever. We've chatted a few times, but I get a sense that uh, I wouldn't say comedy, but laughter is part of your medicine. Yeah. Am I in the right train there? Oh, bro, I'm <laughs> telling you, uh, the, the day I stopped writing books and I stopped oh. yeah, talking to um, churches and stuff, I'm going to drop an old school comedy routine on, on Christians and non-Christians alike. And I'm going to let them yeah. know of the 20 years they've been giving me beat downs on lines and everything. I'm going to drop the hammer because I love comedy. Because I mean, seriously, I'll look at Christian like, excuse my language. Are you effing kidding me right now? I'm not cursing. I'm like, are you effing? Really? Okay. Yep. And, and then on non-Christians, I'm just like, yo, okay, check out. You're stupid. I want to be clear on this. You're saying just to tell people that and then make yep. sure I tell them because I'm all of those things too. But yes, comedy is a huge thing. And then, and everyone's scared because I get, I do racism. All the is they're disgusting. They're stupid. But man, we get to just drop all boundaries and laugh at each other like we did in the firehouse. Man, we would laugh so hard because my whole crew was black. And I, besides me, I'm a red guy, as you can see. And so people call me white. I'm like, no, dude, I'm red. Okay. Yeah. But they would sit there and joke. And I would joke. And it was in-house because we could all handle the joke. Obviously, people out of house, they get like, those guys hate each other. Mm -hmm. No, man, we would joke like no one else's business. And it was a great time to off gas. But we wouldn't cross the lines either that we knew they couldn't handle or Tell that we would walk into someone's house and tell that joke, you know, yeah, so, sure. but we'd leave that house. Let's be honest. Sometimes we doors closed on the fire. We don't look at each other. We just start cracking up with what we just witnessed. That's a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a way to process for sure. It yep. is. Yep. It's such a dicey thing nowadays too, with, you know, like you said, going over that line. Right. 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 Well, a funny, Very just a funny line. thing, not to go too far, but when you hit the fire, I was watching cops or something. It was like in Kentucky and my crew, which are my brothers. I mean, they're at my wedding. They're, they're like in a Kentucky mobile home place or a park or something. And so all of a sudden, funny, the guys look at me all, man, what's wrong with your people? You know, because it was all white folks and stuff. And so I just joked back with them. I walk over the door and open up the door of the fires. And, and as the homeless guys walk by, I'm like, yo, what's wrong with your people? And it was a laughter thing. It was funny. It was no like his people versus my people or anything. But nowadays, if you talk about, the, oh my gosh, that shouldn't have happened. I'm like, but it was brothers and it was okay. And we were just laughing, you know, and stuff. So yeah, I, you got to be careful because I don't want to get anyone in trouble either, nor do I. Mm -hmm. I've offended people and I hate that. The worst yeah. feeling I think you can have is when you accidentally offend someone. I mean, if I want to offend you, I'm not going to feel horrible right away afterwards. But the worst feeling is when later on someone says, yo, dude, you said this and it, man, that it cut yeah. me deep. And you're like, ooh, you know, so it's that line, like you said, you know, you got to be cautious, you know, but man, humor is good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? good for the soul, that's for sure.
There you oh, go. Another story about myself is like I I never had fun as a firefighter, a fire chief. Mm. Work was my life. Mm. And so when I realized that there was more life than than fire, I started having games nights and and stuff with the, with the family and just relaxing and watching sitcoms. Like sitcoms is not something I ever watched. Right. And now I'm addicted to this show called The Office, which I'm sure yeah. everyone's heard of. <laughs> Who isn't? That's a great show, man. I mean, man, that's like I a just firehouse laugh all in an office. You oh, know? yeah. I think that's why I relate to it so well. It's like it's, it is like a firehouse in an office. But yeah, it's, I feel so much better when you get that laugh going and it's just, yeah, good time. Well, it's worth, it's with, worth your time. Right. Cause I would be sitting in West Oakland and my joke with the Christian people, this is a Christian joke is like for crying out loud, you guys, I came to Christ in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is West Oakland, right below Berkeley across from San Francisco. It's a joke with them and yeah. the guys would laugh about that. But what I loved about the firehouse is I would be sitting across from a hardcore Democrat and a hardcore Republican. And we would have great conversations. They would get heavy, very heavy, but check it out. As soon as the conversation was over, we got up and we did dishes and we went out the door to help people because our agenda was to help other people, but we would still speak our mind. And so when someone would tell me something, they loved me because I don't care what side it was, they'd go, someone has spouted out about say like Biden or Obama or something. Then we're like, you're stupid. Then they would talk about someone else, you know, Oh, I'm for Trump. Like, you're dumb. I just like to stir the pot was my thing. Is a, and they knew that about me. So they never asked me my feelings because I tell everyone they're always wrong because I just want to stir everyone up. But even then, you could call it heated, but it truly wasn't heated. I would say it was emotional. We were having good conversations. Dude, it was done. It didn't affect our friendships, you know, and, and stuff. And I, I think that's a good thing to remember that it's good. If I walk into, like I tell people, I walk into church and we all agree on absolutely everything. I'm walking out because I walked into a cult. If I walk into where we all absolutely agree on everything, it's it gets that eerie cultish feeling. Mm -hmm. I want to hear differences of opinions. I think it's a yeah. good thing. I love that. Yeah, I love that. And the bottom line is we're all human. We're all human. doesn't matter where you come from, what religion, what faith. We're human beings, right? Amen, brother. So I'd love to dig in a little bit about uh, your very first book, uh, The Rescuer. What, what was kind of the, the beginning of that? Oh man. So I just, I was speaking at a lot of like men's retreats at churches where I was, cause obviously a faith-based firefighter can bring the stories in blah, 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 and all that. It's a new thing. So I was doing that, but I was going a little deeper and finally some guys started coming around me like, bro, you need to tie this story all together into one. This, this basically it's about nine months of the most impactful time of my life of the lowest times of my life, the struggles I was having. And put together a story. Well, like, dude, I'm a dumb fireman. How do I know how to write a book? You know, we write in blog form. We can tell stories, but it's truly, it's like blog form. So I started figuring it out, the processes, and I had a professional writer come alongside me and he helped me craft it in a way that had the arcs. Nothing got changed. Mm -hmm. Stories not, didn't get changed, but it made it readable. More describe, like, how do you describe yourself when you're writing as yourself, you know? So that's how it came about. And truth be told, I started getting so frustrated and I was getting really kind of wound up. And my Facebook page started taking off on the Christian side. I had like a couple hundred thousand followers at the time. And so a publisher, obviously like, yo, we want you. No, you just want my big platform. Not me. <laughs> Take that for what it's worth. Like, I want you to like me, just yeah. not my big platform. Yeah. But they came alongside me, gave me some money to write it and stuff and held my hand. But halfway through, bro, I, I almost gave them their money back and mm -hmm. threw it out because I was just done, dude. I was like, I'm having to relive, you know, my dad beating me, my childhood sleeping with cockroaches. And I, dude, I didn't even have a true bed until I bought it with my first paycheck from the fire department. Mm -hmm. And I would truly live those, then reliving the shootings and the bad stuff. It was painful. But check this out, dude. I get a call from an FDNY guy because my Facebook page, people know I as faith-based fireman because when you have a Facebook chip page named Jesus is all you need, you know, <laughs> guys will kind of like go over there. So this dude hits me up and he's like, I'm leaving to work tonight, but I'm not going to show up and I'm going to kill myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, dude, this was, the, check this, out. this was the same day I said I wasn't going to write my book anymore. And I said, wow. And we had a mm -hmm. conversation. Well, that was four years ago. We're still friends. He's still wow. alive. That's awesome. And it's not about me, as we all know in the fire service. But the reason I wrote it was because I wanted to be a voice for people because there's a lot of guys and gals that are struggling. I mean, and even the women, you know, out there that say they see my story. I wanted everyone to see themselves in the story. We've all made a hallway. We've all hit a fire. We've all been in some pretty hairball experiences. To be honest with you, those stories are boring to me. But what interests me and the reason I wrote this way is because I wanted to put feelings to those and how those feelings come back and how 
how the evilness I was responding to rode back to the firehouse and he climbed in my truck and then drove home with me. I feel like it resonates with me, you know? And again, my heart is for faith, but if someone doesn't become a Christian, I'll, I really don't care. What I care is maybe it sparks a conversation where they can get the help that they truly need and deserve. Mm-hmm. So that's why I wrote The Rescuer. And it's not written churchy. I mean, there's curse words in there. I'm cursing. You know I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's legit, mm-hmm. but I kept the story real the whole way through. And I purposely ended it right about the point where when I became a Christian, because I didn't want to then drag all these people into that part with me. So that was my first book. And then obviously my second book was for my faith-based people because the rescuer is the backstory to why I'm convicted to believe we need Jesus. So therefore my second book was for those folks that wanted to know more what I learned along the way. I did a Christian devotional, but not in the way most Christian devotionals are done. You know, I brought, brought a little edge to it and stuff. And so, so that was book one. And then book two, the devotional was to kind of back up why I believe what I do. So book one, the audience would be the fire service or first responders. Book two is more general. Is that correct? It's general, but even book one, I thought mm-hmm. firefighters were going to hate book one, bro. I'm mm-hmm. serious. I didn't like, no firemen's going to, firefighters going to read this right. or firewoman. Sorry. And I believe in firefighters. I just have some old terms and I apologize about that, but I didn't think they'd like it. I truly didn't think they'd like it, but they freaking, they it resonated. And then believe it or not, tons of people, I mean, when it sold hundreds of thousands of copies, you know, more than just firefighters read it. So book number two is also for those firefighters and for everyone, you know, and stuff. So basically I wrote it for everyone, but I wanted people to have an interest and a view into our world as firefighters, but I also wanted to be a voice for Christian firefighters or someone who just has questions. Like you can call me up and say, I disagree with everything you wrote. I'm like, all right, let's hear it. And I'll have love to have that conversation. So that mm-hmm. my books are for everyone, you know, and stuff. But obviously a non-Christian is going to pick up a uh, book that says Jesus is all we need placarded right on it and stuff. You know, there's even a story in my book in The Rescue of me buying my first Bible, man. I was hiding that under my arm. I didn't want people to see. I'm walking out of the store and I'm waiting for lightning to strike me and stuff, you know. So so I get it. So I wrote it from yeah. a realistic way that people yeah. just want to, why, why can't we just read a good story that has some Christianity in it or something mm-hmm. else? I, most books I read aren't Christian based, but they're good stories, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it kind of resonates with this, this podcast and everything I'm kind of doing is it's, it's not about the, the fires. It's not about the tactics. It's about the human aspect of being a, a firefighter. Right. And that's, yeah. that's where I want to really niche into and kind of dig into deeper is there's lots of information about there about tactics, throwing ladders, breaking doors, but this human aspect of being a firefighter, I think is, is a missing, it's not missing. There's lots of people out there talking about it, including yourself, mm-hmm. but it's not the same degree as. Yeah. I, I hear you. I, I look at it as two sides, like the PTSD thing. Some truly I'll see it as, as a mark. Uh, it's a good badge. They wear like, dude, take it off. Come on, man. And other people are like, there, there, there's the stigma. And I see all these people. Then the people are like, Oh, let's drop the stigma. I'm like, dude, it's like, you're wearing like pride. It's like, <laughs> chill out. Just a little, I, I just want people to understand that dude, let's, let's come alongside you. And here's what I've experienced. And let's help you. Cause like you've said, I get hit by young firefighters and like, you don't know what you're doing. Da, da, da. I'm like, bro, I'm, I'm not going to throw this card out there, but I'll say this to a couple of guys, bro, I fought more fire my probationary time than you're going to do in your whole career. So shut up with that. Okay. <laughs> I don't bring that by any means of, but, but what I, I try to bring to them is I'm also not this touchy feely guy, dude. I've been there and to have guys like you doing what you're doing and dig into it, but you've been in that foxhole with them. That's what resonates. You bring people outside in to talk to us. We're going to be like, okay, well, that was cool. But when someone like you come in, who has been trained by outside people to bring a certain message or something, guys and gals are going to listen, man, because you've been there with them, you know? Yep. Yep. Love it. So what's one question that I haven't asked you that you wish I asked you? Um, boy, that's wow. Okay. Usually I say (laughs) nothing, uh, nothing, um, sends me for a loop, but I think the one question you haven't asked me is one that we never ask each other is what is the worst thing you've ever had to deal with? Mm-hmm. Because we've been trained not to ask that question. So ask me what the worst thing is I've ever had to deal with. Okay, brother. What's the worst thing you've ever had to deal with in your life? You know, the worst thing that I've ever had to deal with in my life is telling a loved one that their family member is no longer with us, that they're dead. Because you're looking at 
world's changing in real time. You're looking when, when I was holding a little girl and mom comes screaming down the street, a hundred feet out, I could hear her voice, but at 90 feet, it was different. It was intensifying it five feet. out was intensifying. Cause I knew within a minute, her whole world was gonna be turned upside down and she's gonna be hit with a level of pain that none of us could exp ever just ex unless you've gone through it. But the reason I have you ask that to me is because that pain attaches itself to us. Cause every call we go to, I always tell folks, leave the best part of yourself there. Even if it's just a bandage or a hug or it's like kind words and stuff, we're putting out the fire, but we always pick up the worst part of that call. And so the worst thing that's ever happened to me is picking up the pain from every call that we've gone mm -hmm. to and not having a place to drop it off. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest thing I ever had to deal with in my entire life. And it almost took me down. And so. I just want people to understand that if they're going through that out there and stuff, let, let's find you a place where you can put that down, put that heavy bag down and start, start getting you uh, the help that you need. So I love there that. you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a definitely a, a very common, common issue, right? We hold on to it. We take so much pride in the fire service. We take so much ownership in the fire service that we actually turn around and start owning some of that trauma that is somebody else's trauma that we're witnessing. Right. So mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's powerful. Powerful. Yeah, it doesn't become our emergency. Mm -hmm. And people know it's, it's your emergency. No, but we have been called to emergently handle it and take care of it and make it better. But it'll never, ever be our emergency. But we also don't want back away. Oh, it's not my emergency. So we don't give them our all. We have been called to make that emergency better and stuff. But like I say, we got to be equipped to protect the guys and gals out there because I'm telling you, I don't know why certain calls affect me and others don't. I don't know. I've been on some of the most hideous calls and truly it's not one of the rocks weighing me down, but it yeah. may have to get someone else. So I just want people to understand that, you know, um, that, that, that we can help them, that there's brothers and sisters out there that can walk alongside them. And if we're not the person, we can point them to the people they need. Mm -hmm. Love it. So in season two, this has been a new kind of closing question. What in the world does Jason need to, for further support? So how, what, what kind of areas in your life are you needing more support in? Yeah, you know, for um, my brothers and sisters in Christ, just more prayer would be fantastic. And the other support that would really help me is just knowing that people are starting to soften their hearts a little more to help others. Because it, it really crushes my soul when I see I'm from Rescue Company this or Rescue Company that. And, and they're just all about, hey, we're going to be the biggest fools going to all the fools thing to teach you how to fight fire. Dude, love it. Love it. But just, you know, uh, softening of their hearts to help other people. So it just doesn't fall on a few, I guess, you know, and then I know there's more than just me, you and others out there, but if you really look at it, the approachable people out there, there's not that many. And I think that what would be better is if other people made themselves approachable at the company level, at the department level, so they can start handling burdens in-house and getting those people cared for, um, earlier. That's great. Great. Yeah. It's, uh. Well, hopefully it starts at the top, but uh, start anywhere is good. Start anywhere right. is good. Yeah, I agree. So in closing, what would be uh, one key message you want to make sure that our listeners walk away with today? You know, the message I want you to walk away with is just take some time and care for yourself. You're so busy pouring out to everyone else, meaning giving everything you've got to help those around you, including your crew. And even if you're a subordinate, let's talk about it. you're pouring out into your officers and your chief's officers to be the best person you can be. Make sure that you also refill, okay? Get refilled and stuff. Otherwise, you're not going to have anything to offer and you're eventually just going to wisp away into nothing because you're just, you're, you're done and stuff. So I just want, want people to take care of themselves and refill themselves. And when you refill yourselves, keep filling up the other people too. Mm, I like that. I like that. How can uh, people learn more about Jason and uh, maybe purchase your books? Yeah, you know, um, if you just go to Amazon, you know, if you want a book and stuff, they seem to be the cheapest because my books are in all the bookstores and they're everywhere. But there is one website for the firefighters that are listening. It's called rescuerbook.com. So that'll give you a little backstory on the book, The Rescuer. And that's a great place to go to. But the best place is to just go over to Amazon or Google my name. And then I also have a little website named jasonsotel.com. So those would be the spots you could find me. I think you can download a, a free chapter there as well. Just a mm -hmm. preview yep. chapter. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And uh, I enjoy watching. You're very active on social media. And I enjoy watching your journey through uh, your life, but also your books and your messaging and everything like that. So 
it's a pleasure to know you and uh, I hope we can stay connected and continue this journey. Yeah, for sure, man. And thank you so much because I love what you're doing. Let's let's keep it real. Most chiefs don't do what you're going to do. And I'm just throwing that out there. Take it for what it's worth. That's true. So I'm telling you, bro, thank yeah. you for what you're doing at your level because it is so needed. So thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. All right, everyone. Hope you uh, enjoyed this great conversation with Jason. Until next time, stay well. 